Micah. Leon. <laughs> Here we are back at it again. But this time I want to do something different. I want you to go with me on a journey. A journey you and the defense at home are probably very familiar with just being black and gay. Oh, shit. So imagine, if you will, Sunday, fun day in Harlem. I know you live in Harlem, too. Mm -hmm. It is... Before church, a lot of us do that. We go to church, we kiki, we talk about who we slept with in the choir, we look at dick prints. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then after that, we might go out for some day drinking. Mm -hmm. It sounds a very, very 2019, not 2020, because that was a year, a 2019 thing to do, right? Mm -hmm. Imagine it's 1920 Harlem, mm. and these things were happening with people, you may know their names, you may not, but it's happened. Or DC. You're at that popular gay couple's house party. We've uh -huh. all been there. We all know that person. Uh -huh. <laughs> and then afterwards, someone invites you to a ball. Sounds very current. Actually, it happened in 1887, and everyone at that party was probably a former slave. Wow. We can even take it back further to 2387 BCE, ancient Egypt. Them two homeboys that you always see together that you don't know if they're gay, they finally have a picture together, mm -hmm. rubbing noses, which you can still see on the walls of some ancient pyramids. This is about queer history, or queer history as we call this episode. We have always been here, and that's a thing we never get taught. You know, we barely get taught black history. We're, even, we're in debates with that now. But queer history, queer black history, is a thing that's always been around. We have Niggerati Manor. We have Langston Hughes' home that is still a prominent site. Even here in Atlanta, there are so many sites of history that we never get taught about, and you can hardly even find it with a Google search. You have to do deep dives. You have to look through newspapers. But I think the point of this episode is to let people know that you're not alone, you never are alone, and we get to choose how we look at our history, and I choose to look at it in a point where it's more relatable. It's more things that we know today in this day and age. Yeah, I, wow, wow. What a way to like start the conversation because so much of what we talked about is a lack of representation, right? And that being the problem for us as queer, black, and brown folks, you know, not being able to see us in media, but how much more also effective it is in making us feel bad about ourselves and our existence when we can't see ourselves in history. Yeah, I think our personhood is so stripped, and because you will not open a book and find this in your school textbook, we can look at it in a more personable way, a way that we get it, a way where you can imagine James Baldwin out in a house party getting lit, talking to whatever, whoever else. We can have those Zora Neale Hurstons. We know how it, what we, if you can imagine how you go to a house party today, you can imagine how it was then. Not much has changed. I think queer people have passed our history on through word of mouth, you through your gay mothers and your gay fathers mm -hmm. teaching you this way. A lot of that has not changed. In fact, in this country, William Swan Dorsey, the, first, the, the DC gay I was telling you about, the 1887, he was the first person to bring a civil rights case for gay rights to court in America. Wow. And we, you would never know that. I would never know that if I didn't research it. He was the first person to call himself, or they were the first person to call themselves a drag queen. Wow. And that is a fresh, <laughs> fresh out of slavery. Welcome back, Deviants, to another in-depth conversation about queer history, or queer story as we're calling this episode. I have the opportunity to sit with Brenton M. Brock, a PhD student at Howard University with a focus in African diaspora queer stories and history. Yes, exactly. And if there's anything else we need to know about you, please let us know. That's exactly what I do. I'm at Howard in the English department, focusing on 20th century and 21st century African-American diasporic queer literature. I'm focusing on black queer protagonists across narratives and how they experience multivarious forms of violence. So that's, what, what brings you to that focus? It seems like, you know, we don't learn a lot of black history before we get to school. Right. So how do you even discover this trail? Honestly, my experience as a black gay and queer identifying male from the South and how I have experienced violence. And it's been a way to translate my experiences through my profession and my work. So I identify as a black queer identifying male and I know I've experienced violence and reading different literatures and narratives and stories, I've taken into consideration how each protagonist has experienced violence. And I 
translate that to my professional life and my work. I know a lot of times we don't get access to our own history as queer people. I went to an HBCU and the Where'd world, you go? fam you, fam okay. goddamn you. Okay. And you, I was ooh. just so surprised the in-depthness of black history because it's a, a core that you have to go through. You have to take African-American history. And some of the things I was hearing, I thought were lies because I've never heard it before in all my years of school. And, I, and even within FAM's curriculum, I didn't hear any black queer history. So what is, some, what is like a book that's a must read for black queer folks? Well, first I would say congratulations to FAM. You, you all have a winning football season this hey. year. Congratulations. I do understand that HBCUs, we are still, for the most part, homophobic in how we narrate our history. And so I can imagine, I went to HBCU as well and work at an HBCU where we have to find our history for ourselves as Black queer people. However, to answer your question about which book you should read. Now, I study literature, so I will say Daniel Black's Perfect Peace. Okay. It is a novel that was written, I think, in 2010 to where it explores gender in ways that will blow you away. I think every black queer person should read that novel. It's a protagonist that is assigned a gender that is not her biological sex and how the protagonist lives in a way trying to subscribe to gender roles because of the culture, the black culture, trying to say you must act like a man, you must act like a woman. So I don't want to give the novel away, but to answer your question in a very brief way, you should read Perfect Peace by Daniel Black. All right. And you're talking about gender roles within the culture. I know for me, for what I've learned, sometimes gender roles are, like we tell our black girls to be strong because we don't want them to be abused out, out in the outer world. We tell our black boys to calm it down some because we don't want them to be killed, at least historically, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm saying. How do we, is that something we need to talk about? Is that a narrative we need to change now that we're 2021, 20, 2022? Very fascinating question around do we need to change? I understand that it is oppressive to tell young black women that they need to be strong. In a lot of ways, it's dehumanizing to tell them to be strong, which negates their humanity to cry or to be vulnerable, even though vulnerability is a category of strength. And we tell black men to perform masculinity, toxic masculinity, as a way to survive. But I do think what we're hinting at is like re black respectability. Mm -hmm. How do we navigate respectability as a technology of survival so that we can be palatable to whiteness, mm -hmm. so we can be legible to whiteness, so we can be safe Negroes to a white America, to a world that is anti-black. So it's for black queer people, assimilationist politics is viable to live, to thrive in America. And so the root of black queer politics, going back to Kathy Cohen's essay on, um, punks, bull daggers, and welfare queens that she writes. And she talks about black queer politics as a anti-assimilationist politic that pushes us left. And so that can complicate how we live in the world because to be black and queer is to be deviant. Yeah. <laughs> and so deviance has its consequences um, in a world that wants us to be cookie cutter, to be okay. suit and dressed up in a certain kind of way. So you got some church in you. I can tell. I can tell by the way you carry yourself a speech. Which a Is lot this of church. <laughs> it's just the the glow. You got okay. the church glow. And a lot of our history is based in church. A lot of our black history is based in church. Mm -hmm. How do we navigate being black, queer, and religious? That's a loaded question. And we have to always think about who we are as black queer people. I always say we as black queer people are miracles. What we go through is what Dr. Yolanda Pierce would say, a hell without fires. Every one of us experience violence, which like my project is thinking about every day. And so in my own life, faith has been pivotal to how I navigate and negotiate the world. Thinking about God, I had a question in undergrad and I asked myself, is God a black homophobe? Hmm. Because the way I was introduced to God, heterosexism and heteropatriarchy painted my imagination of God. And it was only until I read Alice Walker's The Color Purple, where Suge Avery and Seeley got together yeah. and Suge tells Seeley, like, God is inside of you. And if you read the novel, you understand these are lesbian women yeah. or queer women. Mm. And they're telling each other, Suge is telling Seeley, God is inside of your black queer body. And so for me, I had to actually come to a theological foundation for myself. 
because being rooted in the South, coming from Selma, Alabama, the mother of the social justice movement, God was still social justice, but that was limited. Mm. It did not, justice did not roll down like a river towards the black trans woman or the black disabled per, trans woman as well, or the black queer identifying person. And so for me, we have to be okay with carving out theological discourse for ourselves to where scripture may be the 66 books of the Bible, but I may read James Baldwin's Fire Next Time, where he says, if God is not for us, then we may need to get rid of it. Oh, wow. And that's okay because we want to have a, an imagination of God that includes us. Mm -hmm. God and religion has been a reserved space for black straight people only. And I'm specifically thinking about the black church. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm speaking generatively because we do have different black churches who are affirming. I went to a gay affirming church today. However, when we think of black Protestant denominations, we are still black queer people lobbying for marriage, lobbying for ordination. And why is that the case when we have already done the work of social justice? So for me, I, had, I went to seminary, Princeton Theological Seminary, and had theological questions. And I answered those questions for myself. And how do you do that? Because I was taught you don't question God. I think that's the... the Black parent raising someone with questions. How did you come to be able to question God as a, are you a believer or do you have a faith? I, I am a believer, mm -hmm. but we have to think about Jesus Christ on the cross. What he thinks he asked, why, oh God, have you forsaken me? That's a theological question. <laughs> so the notion of not questioning God is a notion that will, that blocks you from getting to answers. Mm -hmm. We have to, we have to ask God questions because I believe that God answers those questions and when I'm thinking about just being in connection with Christianity and being you know, a Christian myself, I think about how these violences imposed upon black or brown queer people are anti-Christ. Oh, wow. I mean, let's just think about it. Love thy neighbor as thyself. That's Christian work. That's Christian ethics. In a lot of ways, when we maintain black heteronormativity or heterosexism or even heteropatriarchy, all these kind of violences, are we really being Christian? That Perhaps we may be saying that, but yes, question God, ask God. <laughs> we as black people have endured suffering in this world mm -hmm. where we ask theological questions. I'm a theologian by training and I ask God questions all the time. For me, being a black queer man from the South, I'm asking like, God, can I be gay and still worship you? That's a real question. Yeah, that's a question that we a lot of us that's ask That's a real well. question. That's an existential strange crisis. It is the question of Baldwin. It's the question that Baldwin asks himself, and in fiction he writes about. We see this in The Color Purple. I'm a literature scholar, so I mean, oh, no, you I can take you to the literature. <laughs> you have taken me. But we have to ask those questions of ourselves and give our own, give ourselves epistemic authority mm. to say, I'm aligning myself. Me loving you as a black queer man loving you, it is Christian. And it's godly. It is godly. And it's okay to say that for ourselves. So we have to take agency and do what Paul did in the Bible and write out scripture. Oftentimes, and this will be the last thing I say about this, oftentimes we forget that theology is a human construction. Mm -hmm. The Bible was written by man. And so these revelatory moments that you see Paul having, he writes out in the Bible according to the narrative. And so can we write scripture? We were covering that question a little earlier today. Like what if there was a third testament and it took mm -hmm. place now, who would the savior or Christ be? Would there be a black trans woman what would the following be? How, how radical would Christianity be now if it was still being written? I would say that Christianity is still being written today. When we look at movements such as Black Lives Matter, I read those moments and those protests as revolutionary Christianity in ways that are trying to recognize the humanity of another person. Mm. And I view that in a very Christian or Christological way to say these moments where black people are lobbying for the recognition of their humanity. Black people, but also let's nuance it, black trans women. You brought black trans women who are trying to render visible and uh, get grammar to articulate their suffering because we in our community, we feel like gayness and transness is a choice. Mm -hmm. So we don't even re render that as a violence that we're imposing upon them. So. We have to, yes, let the black trans woman write scripture, write the New Testament anew. Let's write New Testaments yeah. that are in line with Christian ethics. Yeah. Um, in today's news, we hear a lot about critical race theory and how we're teaching that in schools. What, what's your feeling about that? 
especially when it relates to a queer critical race theory and who do we teach it to and who teaches it? Critical race theory has become a hot topic in society today, particularly in Virginia. We saw how a lot of people were weaponizing critical race theory as a way to ban critical race theory and teaching to America. But I do feel as if critical race theory is a lens or theoretical framework for American citizens to imagine or think critically about race and how it has material effects in our world today. As it relates to queer people, we have to consider how race dictates, impedes, and mediates our experiences as American citizens. We are black queer people, or we are brown queer people. And so we have to always have a race and class analysis in how we think about our world today. So when we think about critical race theory and teaching it, we should teach it because we are all race subjects. Whether you are white, black, brown, or whatever your ethnicity is, we all are race subjects in this American schema. So to teach critical race theory is not anti-white. It is a real way to think about American democracy and how do we get towards American democracy, acknowledging the cultural diversity, but also saying this is our history. Mm -hmm. And this is a framework to look at how race fundamentally in animates our legal system. So for me, as a black queer person, we should definitely invest in critical race theory, but to think about intersectionality, to think about how race, gender, class analysis animate our lives today. So. I would say we definitely need to think about, we have to be invested in critical race theory to push us toward a more democratic society. Do you see yourself in politics? Do I see myself in politics? Hmm. I do not. I would love to be a professor. I would teach the politician. Do you think you can do more real work outside of being a politician by being a professor and by teaching? You could do more radical work because I know politicians are stifled sometimes when they get in office. Politicians and politics is a game. Mm -hmm. And so you have to appease your audience in ways that I don't know if I'm committed to doing that work. However, I'm always for lobbying on behalf of people who cannot lobby for themselves. So in a lot of ways I have a politic, mm -hmm. but I don't know if I would um, align myself with American politics as of now. Okay. If I feel the need, I would definitely go home to Alabama and run for, oh, yeah. run for an office so that I can you know, use legislation to lobby for our people to get the resources that they need because it's important work. It is important work. Now, they tell me about you. Okay. And your wealth of information, but they probably didn't tell you about me. Okay. So let's have some fun. Let's do it. Now, thinking through queer, black, historical figures, which one would you smash? Smash? Mm-hmm. Smash. Mm -hmm. Let have some. Let have a some. A little session. A little session. I do Could not. Could Baldwin get some? Could Baldwin. Or Baldwin just be a friend? Baldwin would be a friend. Everyone would be a friend. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Lexi would get some. Everyone would be a friend. Um, I don't know. I, I know, really, I know that I, was a little, that was a little out person. of pocket. <laughs> no, it's fine. I, I mean, we, you know, we can say out of pocket, but to be honest, we think about smashing all the time. All the time. But I do not know which queer person in history would. I would love to sit and talk with Lorraine Hansberry mm. and talk with James Baldwin and talk with Barrett Rustin. So you'd and like to be in Harlem? I would like. love to be in the Harlem Renaissance. Mm. Maybe Langston Hughes. Why? <laughs> he, no, we're not going to get into it. We're not going to get into it. <laughs> Maybe like things, but I definitely would like to be in that era to write and talk and think about the world. Well, thank you for everything that you've taught us and thank you for the book recommendation. I know oh. you're coming out with a book soon. I am. Okay. I am. Can you tell us more about that or is it still under wraps or should we contact you in a new way? Um, I can say a little bit. Right now I'm thinking about violence mm -hmm. and how black, the black queer protagonist in African-American literature experiences violence in multivarious forms beyond just physical manifestations of violence. So kind of thinking about structural antagonism such as theological violence, such as violence as it relates to gender, thinking about intimate partner violence in ways that we don't really occupy the public conversations about. So that's what I'm working on now. Stay tuned. Look forward I'm to excited. it. I am I'm excited. Too. And I will definitely send you a copy first. Oh, definitely. You have to sign it too. <laughs> definitely. Send me two because I'm going to sell one on eBay. <laughs> <laughs> and I how can no we problem. find you? Well, I'm on Instagram, Brenton M. Brock. I'm on Instagram and Facebook, Brenton Miles Brock. I don't have a web channel or anything, but you will definitely stay tuned to my Instagram. I try to give out resources to everyone to read and think with. And so find me there. All right. Thank you so much. Oh, Thank my you for pleasure. sharing with us. My pleasure. Um, 
And we don't we never think of gay slaves, but we know there had to be some. We think of bug breaking and all this other stuff, and it erases just our queer history. And that's why we have no relatable way to say, oh, you can't do this, you can't do that, because we don't see it. We don't think it's a part of the black experience where it is the black experience. Right, right. I think that is so um, interesting how, you know, black culture is counterculture in white America, right? But we don't ever, as a larger community, question uh, why heterosexism is such a thing also. Like, why aren't the black community going up more for queer culture as a counterculture? Mm -hmm. um, and even recognizing that queer black folks are a part of the, the movement against white supremacy, you know? Some people can even argue that to be black is to be queer, you know? Yeah. We don't have any mainstream, we, we do have, we make pop culture, we make mainstream culture, and a lot of that black culture that makes pop culture is black gay culture. You know, we have the Santanas of the world, but even before Santana, we've had these entertainers, we've had these people who have, I can't even say they have opened up a path because we erased them. Mm -hmm. We have to remember them. Black history can't be um, reimagined every 20 years or every 10 years or every five years. We can't be the first to do this all the time when right. there have been first throughout the world. Right. Um, and even as you like, I really appreciate you taking me on that like journey in, the, in my mind. Um, I love when you took me to Egypt and to see and just like think about who we were as the people before colonization like what types of freedoms we had, how we were able to like embrace one another as a culture. It even reminds me of like indigenous people and uh, I guess specifically in like Mesopotamia in America, uh, there used to be uh, gender queer people called two-spirit mm. and they were looked at as being closer to God. They were almost, um, I, don't, I don't know that they were either worshiped, but they were certainly almost looked at as like a priest. They were the person who had the divine connection and to think that like in indigenous culture, we've come from that to now living in a society where we're taught uh, to hate the trans and non-binary bodies so much that they're met with the threat of death on a daily basis. Yeah, we don't see it as divine anymore. I know somebody on Twitter said when Cleopatra got the bang and the bob, the gays had the gag. <laughs> I saw that, yeah. <laughs> and that is, it just speaks to, because they probably did. Gag. Yeah. It just speaks okay. to how much no matter how many things change, things are still the same. And the beautiful thing about Black queer culture is because it's not so mainstream, is because it had to be passed down by someone to meet someone else, is that we get to have these imaginations. We are, we're the same, we, you know. And Deviants, here on this episode of Queer Story, I have Mr. Leslie Hall. Leslie is the HBCU director at the HRC. Now, Leslie, what led you into that work? Wow. Um, I had no intention of working at the Human Rights Campaign. Um, it was really just a microcosm of experiences. Uh, prior to working at HRC, I was in development and fundraising, uh, meeting a lot of people, networking. Uh, and I met a board member of HRC um, at another event. And she had mentioned that uh, they were creating uh, a historically black college universities program. And um, I, she thought that I would be a good fit and that I should apply. And I applied. And the rest, and six years later, <laughs> mm. I'm still there. So it's been good. Awesome. And I mean, the human rights campaign, why did they have a need for an HBCU director or program? Even? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's a good question. Oh, um, so uh, about, uh, let's say, 12 years ago, um, there were a, a series of unfortunate events happening at HBCUs all across the country. Um, LGBTQ people weren't able to be them full selves as students or as faculty members. Um, and then there were some really violent events. Some students were being assaulted uh, verbally and physically. Um, and the Human Rights Campaign, being <clears throat> the largest civil rights organization for LGBTQ people, uh, felt a need to do something about that. Um, and so uh, they started doing the Leadership Summit about 12 years ago. Um, and that's when they bring uh, LGBTQ HBCU students to D.C. for a week of leadership development training, uh, identity development, relationship building, 
Um, but more importantly, we wanted to train those students to be able to be uh, change makers to go back to their campuses uh, to, to make a difference. And um, uh, over, those, over that period of time, HRC realized that students are transient, they graduate, they, they are not always as reliable. Um, and so they needed to focus more so on the staff portion and the, and, and the university leadership to create more sustainable solutions to these issues. And so um, they needed someone with my experience awesome. <laughs> in order to do that. Uh, and so, uh, you know, six years ago, they, they recruited a, a, di a director. Awesome. And I've been there ever since. That's yeah. amazing. So uh, HBCUs, it sounds like the HRC has really tapped into uh, the black elite. You know, they've tapped into a group of people. Uh, black folks who go to HBCUs are astronomically uh, higher percentage-wise of going into professions. Sure. Is that... In no, you're spot on. I mean, um, the, the, the bulk of our doctors and lawyers um, and professional folks that, that we see in the world all receive their, their either their undergrad or both professional and undergrad degrees from HBCUs. I mean, Howard alone is the leading producer of black doctors and lawyers wow. um, in this country, um, Phenomenal. period. Phenomenal. You know? And so yeah. um, when you add in other institutions like Southern University, who has a law center, and Texas Southern, who has a law center, um, Howard is one of the only uh, HBCU medical schools that are there. We have Meharry Medical School, which is in um, Tennessee, and then uh, another medical school in, in L.A. But those, are, that's it. Yeah. Um, but, but, you know, Howard alone, and I'm not just saying this because I'm a Howard alum, but Howard <laughs> alone, you know, the bulk of your dentists, uh, doctors, lawyers, uh, black dentists, black doctors and lawyers all come from, from HBCUs. And that is so powerful to me as I hear it, because these are black folks who are going to go back to their communities, or even if they don't go back to their communities, they are doctors and lawyers that we can identify with as, right. as black folks, you right. know, uh, they're now somebody I can be honest and transparent with when I'm talking about my health and health care. This is fantastic as it literally like paves the way for uh, an amazing future for right. black folks, right? right? But this episode is, you know, also about queer story, right? right. Queer right. history. Um, who are the, whose shoulders do you sit on today? Right. As, yeah, as you're yeah. the HBCU director at the HRC. Ooh, yeah, I mean, my, my, my. I mean, I, <laughs> there's so many folks, both you know, who are known and who are unknown, whose shoulders that I, that I stand on. And I'm still learning of shoulders that have paved the way, you know, folks that have paved the way for me. But, um, you know, to that question, I, the, the most prominent person that I kind of engage with on a daily basis in, in literature, because he's not alive, um, is uh, Dr. Elaine Locke. Um, and he uh, was an openly uh, gay um, at the time. That wasn't a thing, but he wasn't straight, <laughs> um, professor at Howard University. Oh, he has wow. a building named after him now. Um, but he is credited with being the father of the Harlem Renaissance. Um, he was the mentor to Langston Hughes. Um, and so, you know, he created this idea of uh, the new Negro mm. coming out of, the, coming out of the, um, the, the early 20s and 30s. It was like we needed to put our creativity and our culture and our art somewhere and, and, and create an aesthetic that, that really supported um, our, our community and our culture. And uh, Elaine Locke um, really did a lion's share of the work. He, did not, he doesn't always get a great deal of the prestige um, uh, because a lot of the work that he did was very scholarly. Um, and that's not very easily digestible to the, to the common man. But um, in terms of the work that I do on HBCUs, I mean, how it translates into my, my academic life, but also my personal life, my pro professional life, rather. Uh, it is certainly Dr. Elaine Locke. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. Um, and I know, uh, again, we're talking about, you know, an astute, an elite, but we've also talked about those black queer folks mm -hmm. uh, who may have not had the education, may right. have, but were, you know, all the more part of the struggle as right, well. Right. Who are some of those folks who also Yeah, I mean, you know, more often time than not, it is those folks, the, the folks that um, that shake the table are the ones that, that aren't always in the upper echelons of society. Um, and so when I think about it, I, I immediately think of, um, you know, what we call now black trans women. Back then, we, that wasn't necessarily the term, but more, folks like Marsha P. Johnson um, from out of New York and uh, 
Sylvia Rivera, those folks um, who had no real form, formidable, uh, but, uh, formal education, but uh, was all the smart, the like, you know, in, in, the, in the city. But um, those folks like that, um, because of the work that they did, and they didn't even know they were doing work, they were just mm-hmm. surviving. And that's the, that's the beauty of it, right? Like we can look back in our with our degrees and stuff and uh, analyze and say, oh, they were this and that, they did that. They were just surviving. Um, and so, I mean, I can, you know, just thinking about those shoulders, like, you know, Marsha, who, who was poor, who had nothing, uh, essentially, um, uh, living in New York City uh, and just wanted to be able to frequent a bar. Leslie, you just mentioned Marsha P. Johnson, yeah. who and Sylvia, P. R- and Sylvia Rivera, two trans women, one black, one brown, who are both credited with throwing the first brick at Stonewall. Right the Stonewall riots that started the whole gay liberation movement. And I can't help but draw the connection between Marsha P. Johnson, the gay liberation movement and the HRC that you work at today. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, those are hella lines to draw, right? Um, You know, we use this, we, we celebrate pride every year, right? And folks in our community don't always fully appreciate the, the prelude to, to why we're out here clubbing and partying and stuff, right? And we want to have a good time. We should have pride in ourselves because we spent so long not feeling prideful in who we are. But it is, it is also doing a disservice to those who have come before us to not at least reflect on the journey mm-hmm. uh, and where we need to go. And so, you know, nowadays I've seen uh, HRC, we um, have a theme called Pride Was First a Riot. Yeah. Pride started as a riot. Um, and that's really just to center this whole idea that, you know, things haven't always been as good as they are now for us. Um, but HRC really started um, in, 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 in response to the HIV AIDS uh, epidemic that essentially was still headquartered in New York City, mm-hmm. um, at, you know, right after the worker, really probably during the same time as Marsha P. Johnson and those folks. Uh, where black folks were not uh, gain, gaining access to the types of uh, medical me- medicines that were even available then, and those medicines were killing, killing folks. And so, um, you know, white folks and black folks, we were all dying uh, in, in relation to the AIDS epidemic. And um, HRC was founded by a group of gay men uh, in response to that. Um, and they realized that our power, uh, well, their power, <laughs> uh, <laughs> really kind of rested in political action. Um, we can be out in the street all day long, but until we have uh, f- folks in, in Congress and in the White House that support us and support the, the work that we need to do, um, that's where the real change happens. And so that's how HRC really was, was, was built to become a, a, a political powerhouse the way that it is, because um, you know the folks that, that founded the joint realized that you know, being the the direct action is great, but we need political power. Um, And I think uh, for the black black LGBTQ community, we're still trying to build that black political power. We're just now getting to a place where we have more than one openly gay black person in Congress. And, you know, Joe Biden, for in all his glory, has certainly elevated uh, several um, black LGBTQ folks within his administration and within throughout the, the cabinet and whatnot. And so we're just now finally creeping up to to realize uh, the black political power that we need to have. But we still have a lot of work to do yeah. because, you know, Atlanta had, you know, two openly gay um, black folks running uh, and, you know, they weren't successful. And that's and it could be a number of reasons why that is the case. Right. But for when you talk about population, it's like. I mean, this is <laughs> this, this is where you get it, you know. And if you can't make it here, <laughs> you know, uh, where are you going to be able to make it? And so we still have a lot of work to do. And that's why it's important for us to always just put things into context. And that's why pride is important that we just understand where we've come from. Absolutely, Leslie. Thank you so much for sharing uh, your mind, and thank you so much for your work that you do in uplifting our community uh, still um, and consistently. Um, thank you for lending your voice here to us today at Deviant. Um, can you please let our Deviants know where they can find you, where they can support your work, um, where they can tap in to like achieve and attain that sure. 
political power. Sure. Well, well, thank you so much for, for having me. I, I just I just love this. And I think this is incredible, incredible work that you're doing. So thank you for that. Um, but to support our work at the Human Rights Campaign, hrc.org forward slash HBCU is how you can uh, kind of plug in to see what we're doing on HBCU campuses. We also have a Facebook a Facebook group, uh, Human Rights Campaign, HBCU program. And if you want to connect with me personally, uh, I'm Leslie D. Hall on all the platforms. So that makes it easy. Um, IG, Twitter, and Facebook. That's that's about all my mind can handle. I can't <laughs> do any more socials than all. <laughs> Deviants, we're looking forward to this and many more episodes. Please check us out. And we want to hear your voices and who you want to hear about in history. We want to reimagine with you what our futures can be like, but also how we're going to pave our textbooks. So please meet us at deviant.live backslash play. There you can find this survey, this and many more episodes. And yeah, deviants, till next time.